Parental support plays an important part in helping preteens and teens succeed in middle school. But as students grow more independent during these years, it can be hard for a parent to know which situations call for involvement and which call for more behind the scenes approach. In Atomas Unified, we believe that every student can learn and succeed. Here are some tips to keep your student on track for academic success in middle school. Get to know the campus and culture of the school your student will be attending. Take advantage of campus tours and functions the year before middle school. Knowing more about the school can help you connect with your student when you talk about their school day. It's also important to know what the academic and behavior expectations are of the school. Attending back to school night at the start of the school year is a great way to get to know your students' teachers, learn their expectations, and for them to meet you. Expect a total of one to two hours of homework each night. Check on your students' grades weekly through your Infinite Campus Parent Portal. Being organized is a key to success in middle school. Students will encounter multiple teachers in classrooms on a daily basis. Some students will be participating in extracurricular or after-school activities for the first time. Using a planner or agenda can help your students stay on track. Be sure you and your student know when tests are scheduled and plan enough study time before each test. Ensure the school has your most updated communication information so that you can receive notifications in a timely manner. Communicate with teachers regularly. Feedback on how to support your student at home is important to their success. It's important that your student arrives at school on time every day because having to catch up with classwork can be stressful and interfere with learning. Volunteering at your student's school is a great way to show you're interested in their education. Also encourage your student to take advantage of the opportunities to get involved with an on-campus club or organization. Make an effort to talk with your student every day. They will know that what goes on at school is important to you. When students know their parents are interested in their academics, they'll take school more seriously. Keep in mind, education is a partnership between home and school. If at any time you have concerns or questions about your student, please don't hesitate to contact the teacher or the school counselor. Here in Atomas Unified, our vision is that all students graduate as college and career ready, productive, responsible, and engaged global citizens. We look forward to your student success. Thank you for taking the time to watch this Parent University video on how to support your student in the transition to middle school. Please help us improve the Parent University website by taking our survey. The first strategy that you're going to see is a talk routine called Which One Doesn't Belong? And uh, the purpose behind this particular strategy is constructing viable arguments and critiquing the reasoning of others. The math activity is called Which One Doesn't Belong? And with this one, you're going to notice that there's going to be four boxes. So we're going to have box one, box two, box three, and box four. And your guys' job is you're going to be trying to construct a viable argument about which box doesn't belong and why. In other words, one of the boxes does not fit with the other three boxes. And then they'll be able to have an opportunity to share with their partner and decide whether their argument is making sense or possibly if it's not making sense to their partners. I think box one doesn't belong because it's the only equation that doesn't use it. Uh, no, sorry, uh, multiplication. I think it's box two because the circ I mean the stars are circled and box one, three, and four are not circled. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. So embedded in which one doesn't belong is the strategy you show me on your fingers. Okay, before I have you move to your corners, I want you to show me on your fingers which box, one, two, three, or four, which box you don't think belongs. Just show me on your fingers. Hold it up high so I can see. Okay, I'm seeing mixture. I see ones. I see some people saying twos. I see three. I see fours. Okay. Really, it is a strategy designed to give the teacher some formative feedback to see what students are initially thinking 
either before some sort of partner talk or possibly before some sort of movement in the classroom where they're going to have a discussion. Okay, Natalia, are you going to share your argument or your partner's? Mine. Okay, go ahead. So I think number one doesn't belong because it's the only one with addition, plus the stars in it aren't like um, inked in. All right. How many people, does that make sense to them? All right. Different argument? So I've heard one and four. Anyone else? Different argument. Uh, right over here. Okay, Robert, are you going to share your argument or your partner's? Mine. Okay, go ahead. I think box three doesn't belong because it's the only box that uses the number four. How many people? Does that make sense? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I didn't hear anyone share about box two. So I'm going to turn you back to your partners, and I want you and your partner to take a moment, see if you and your partner can come up with an argument of why box two would not belong. Okay, partners, go ahead. I think box two does not belong because it's the only one that uses a dot for multiplication. How many people does that make sense? This one we're going to do another which one doesn't belong, uh, but this time we're going to do a little bit of movement in the room. Movement in the classroom is something that we feel really passionate about. We think it's very important. It can be a little scary to have middle schoolers get up and start moving around, but with which one doesn't belong. The way it's structured is it allows students that physical movement to actually get up and move throughout the room, but it also gives them an opportunity to share with different partners that they may not get the opportunity to share in their seats. So you're trying to get a lot of cross-pollination across the room and try to get as many ideas to spread across the room as you can. Okay, get you out of your seat and move around a little bit. So you're still going to have private think time. I'm still going to give you your private think time to come up with your argument or multiple arguments. Um, but what we're going to do instead to, to the share out part is after a private think time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you guys move to a corner of the box you don't think belongs. So they're labeled just like they are up here. Students are provided with some private think time to create argument and then also embedding in partner talks for students to practice their arguments before going to a whole group setting. So here's what we're going to do in a moment. In a moment, you're going to go to your corner, whichever box you don't think belongs. Reminder, one, two, three, four. And you're going to find a partner. And you're going to share your argument. So again, here's your sentence starter. I think box. And you're going to be in the same, the same corner. So you'll both share the same box. However, you, you'll notice you might have picked the same box, but you might have a different argument. So that will be really interesting. OK, you guys ready? All right, here we go. Let's get up, move to your corner, find your partner. Box number one, because it needs to be the only one that's a repeating decimal. Because it's the only one that has that sign. But isn't uh, number two and three repeating because they're also one third? All right, so what we're going to do, um, there's a lot of people in corner one. So we're going to start there um, with a quiet hand of anyone willing to share why you guys selected um, box one to not belong. Okay, thank you. What's your name? Michael. Okay, Michael. It's the only decimal. How many people does that make sense to them? All right. In that corner, by showing quiet hands, how many people, that was your argument? Yeah, I anticipated that. But that, there was another hand up over there that said there was a different argument for corner one. And who was that? Was that you? What's your name? Robert. Robert? OK, Robert, what was your argument? It was the only one with the number zero in it. All right, so the only brave one that went to corner two. What was um, your argument for corner two, box two? I think box two doesn't belong because the two and the three are both prime numbers. We chose box three because uh, the box three has a point twenty-five, while the rest of them are related to uh, a third. How many people view that? I chose box four because it's the only number that has a value greater than one. How many people does that make sense? 
So with the strategies of which one doesn't belong and would you rather, these strategies in particular allow access for all students to be able to come up with an argument. Regardless of their perceived mathematical ability, what these strategies do is provide what we call a low floor and a high ceiling. They're so open-ended that anyone can be able to make some sort of argument or an observation to be able to share. I would say the high ceiling part of it allows students to really escalate their mathematics to whatever level they feel that they're capable at that time. With the strategy of would you rather, it's a scenario where you give the students two options and again embed the private think time and then you allow them to pick which option they would like to construct an argument about and they will move to that side of the room. So in the example today you'll see an option A and an option B. All right, we are going to do uh, one more activity together. This one's a little bit different. This one is not a which one doesn't belong. This one is called would you rather. Okay, so you're gonna have two choices and you're gonna have to figure out would you rather on each one of these choices. And again, you're still gonna be trying to construct a viable argument um, to say why your choice might be better than someone that picked the other choice. So I'm gonna show you two options of how you're gonna be paid. Uh, option A or option B for taking your younger sibling trick-or-treating. How many of you have a younger sibling, a younger brother or sister? Okay. Option A, you'll get paid one dollar per house in four hours. Or option B, you get eighty dollars for four hours without counting houses. If you're going to go with option A, if you think that's the argument that you want to try to defend, you're going to be moving to this half of the room in a moment. If you're going to go with option B, you're going to move to that half of the room. And just like when we did four corners, once you get to your side of the room, you're going to partner up. You're both going to share your arguments of why you selected option A um, or if you selected option B. Okay, you ready? So here we go. Option A is over here. Option B is over here. Let's go. Partner up. Shoot. Movement in the classroom is something that we feel really passionate about. We think it's very important. It can be a little scary to have middle schoolers get up and start moving around. It allows students that physical movement to actually get up and move throughout the room, but it also gives them an opportunity to share with different partners that they may not get the opportunity to share in their seats. So you're trying to get a lot of cross-pollination across the room and try to get as many ideas to spread across the room as you can. I think it's because you can't make, um, go to that many houses in just four hours. For option B, it's only um, $20 per hour, so we calculated 80 divided by 4. Yeah, you're not getting like any more. No more, no less. Air, just 80. So option A, if you only go like yeah. 20 houses per hour, that's measly. So like, for every hour, there's at least 50 houses, so it's way more than 80. Yes. <laughs> And the next step after that is students actually moving into more of a debate. So we would call it constructive controversy of trying to state their arguments and see if they can convince someone from the other side to come to their side based on the convincing argument that they create. And I will say this, at any time during share out, if you are, let's say, on side B, and something that someone says on side A really convinces you, they came up with a really strong argument, you're more than welcome to leave your side and move over to the other side. And the same thing, A's, if B's convince you, you can change your mind and move to the other side, okay? 
I didn't expect it, but students do change their mind. And within that, it's just fascinating to hear what was the convincing part of an argument that would draw them to one side or the other. There's more A's, so we're gonna start with A's. Okay, here we go. I would choose option A because it really only takes like a minute to go to house and house, and you get a lot more money in four hours. And I would want more money than just that. <laughs> How many people does that make sense? Okay, so I'll check in. B's, you, anyone convinced that they want to switch sides? Not yet? Okay, all right. I heard another argument over on option A that I was hoping someone would be willing um, to share. For option B, you get like only $80 guaranteed, and like you don't get any more, but like, tw and we did 80 divided by four, so like $20 per hour, so 20 houses per hour. That's just me, so you probably get at least 50 an hour, so we'll get more money if we do option A. I chose option B because if you divide how much you get and then the four hours, that means 20 houses per like, you know, hour. And like usually when I go trick-or-treating or whatever, I don't go to 20 houses like per hour. How many people does that make sense? All right, anyone from A convinced? No, hold, okay, you're holding. Usually, uh, um, most houses are usually closed, so like it's gonna like waste a lot of time. A's, what do you think? Anyone convinced? You're convinced? All right, get over there. All right. <laughs> when you see students change their mind and they move from one side to the other, uh, that's an opportunity to really celebrate. And what I mean by that is celebrate revising thinking. Many times middle school students are very hesitant to share an idea that is different from their peers. So when students do change their mind and change sides, we celebrate that. And we talk a lot about how mathematicians are constantly revising their thinking and just how important that is to the mathematics that they will be doing in the real world. All right, can I, um, can I ask you what, what convinced you? What argument changed your mind? Anita's, I don't know how to say it. Argument? Argument. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the houses can be closed and can waste a lot of time. That's why. All right, thank you. Cool. There's been times where students have created an argument that I never even really thought of. And that's probably the most exciting and fun part of doing these strategies is when students' creativity and their mathematical thinking is displayed to the rest of the class and to myself as the teacher. Many students come to the math classroom with a negative disposition. And these talk routines, they're so open-ended and also showing that there's multiple approaches when it comes to solving mathematical problems. And they're structured in such a way that students become more and more comfortable being able to share their mathematical ideas. And with that comes more and more confidence in their skills. So this isn't a question, but everyone raise their hand really, really high, really high, really high up in the air. Okay, now pat yourself on the back. You guys were a blast. Um, again, thank you so much. We're finding that within this growth mindset, the more students are engaged in productive struggle, the more they're seeing the potential of their own learning in and around mathematics. So today we will see productive struggle. I predict that some kids will kind of be challenged by some of the pieces in our problem today. There's that fine line of productive struggle and then frustrating struggle. And so as an instructor, it's finding that balance and knowing what pivotal question to pose so that the productive struggle continues but in route to that fruition of being able to problem solve. In terms of productive struggle, I think that that's key for students to learn. And so giving them problems that challenge them, that they really have to think about, how should I go about tackling this? What are some different strategies that I could use? Now we're gonna read this again. What I'd like to have happen now is I'd like partner B, my partner B, to read to partner A, and now, 
um, both partners will describe the quantities in the problem. So remember in the first time we didn't use quantities, now the second time around we're going to use quantities. I would show them multiple ways to multiply fractions or using bar models. Students were kind of pushing against me and we talked about the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset and that sometimes having more than one way to solve a problem is going to be helpful for you and we can't always just rely on one thing because that's what we're comfortable with, that we have to stretch ourselves brain is a muscle and the only way that your muscle is going to grow and be stronger is by trying new things. Partner A's, I'd like you to discuss with partner B what your drawing uh, looked like or what your model looked like. I drew a, a focus square around it to represent the frame, uh, yeah, and in the middle I wrote 400 inches to represent the area. And so giving them problems that challenge them so that they're not being spoon-fed how to do a problem and they're going to have a better understanding of the problem and more buy-in if they kind of struggle at first. Why would it be perimeter versus area? Great question. Let's have a discussion with your partner. You got 30 seconds. Go. We already know the area, which is 400 square inches. 400, yeah. And then the perimeter is unknown and the perimeter is basically the wood trim because it's around. Yeah, because like a fence is a perimeter around the grass area. Yeah, so, so that's basically yeah, the area that they And so what I'll do is while students are working on the problems, I'll walk around the room and see some student work that I think would be beneficial for other students to see. And so either I will have the students come up and explain what they've done so far, or I'll bring up the work myself and ask questions to the class. All right, so we're going to look at two different students work. Here the student has a model, right? And they have 400 inches squared. They drew a picture of the picture. And then they have four sides and they have question marks for the length of four sides. So we have two answers, 100 inches and 80 inches. So with your partner, I want you to discuss why do we have two different answers? So 25 on each. I've really worked on encouraging kids to try more than one way. And it's been very powerful to see kids' reactions once they start using a new strategy. You put 100? No, it's 20. Why is it 20? I just realized that. Why? Because length times width, that's, and that's how you get the area, and the length would have to be 20 okay. times 20. Oh, okay. It's particularly exciting at the 7th and 8th grade years to see kids enjoying mathematics, coming to the math class and saying, I want to learn more today, I can learn more today. I have a mathematical mind. I can be a mathematician. And they're starting to see number through that lens. I think my role is to facilitate, if they're working with partners, to kind of facilitate the conversation, but not to give them the answer, ask you know, guiding questions, but to still allow them to struggle and still allow them to do that self-discovery of the math problem and the answer. What do we think? Those of you that think it's 100, that would go 100, the perimeter's going to be 100, raise your hand. Okay? Those of you that think the perimeter's going to be 80, raise your hand. Okay? So, um, for those of you that think it's going to be uh, 100, um, why don't you talk to me about why do you think it's going to be 100? Why do you think it's going to be 100? Here's what I'd like you to do. With your partners, I want you to discuss what was the smart mistake in uh, the answer with, with 100? What was the smart mistake that was made here in this uh, particular problem? Because 100 times 100 times 100 times 100 equals like, like a million or something like that. And like, there? Um, well, they're trying to find four each side at first, and if you were to add uh, 104 times that, you could 400, which would be incorrect because the area and perimeter cannot be the same. Area cannot equal perimeter. There is some struggle, but the reward is so great that after you've worked so hard and persevered and really put their effort into it, they can see the reward of all their hard work with trying new strategies. I think that the growth mindset really has moved 
not only instructor pedagogy, but also student learning. It's very, very exciting to see. I think that growth mindset in mathematics has been a linchpin also to a growth mindset just in general for students to see that mistakes are okay. I can struggle. Productive struggle actually is a good thing. If I'm not actually struggling, wherein lies the learning? Today's lesson and objective was really about getting the kids to talk about some tasks that we put forth to them. And our goal really was just to see what they came up with. So part of my deal today was I was listening and walking around and trying to think about how I can enhance the lesson by questioning strategies, but letting them work through the problem first. So at the beginning of class, I focused on the warm up to get them going. Originally, I had them start and just look at the problem and see if they can make sense of the problem and decide at what direction they wanted to go in. After a few minutes, I chose to then have them talk in an A-B partners to see kind of if their neighbor had the same strategy they did. And then I followed that up by going to a four group and letting them discuss it together and come up with the best plan that their group wanted to present. After that, I went into a performance task, uh, which allowed the kids to keep that group momentum going and questions that I posed in the warm-ups were kind of a lead-in to get them to think of those things while they were also doing the performance task. It was something that I wanted the kids to explore and I thought it was meaningful when I hear the kids say something that I go from there and kind of change my instruction or at least change the way I directed where I wanted them to go with that. For all of my group work that I ever do, whether it's A and B partners or four groups, um, I spend a lot of time in my seating chart. So I'm very specific on who sits where and why they sit there. For example, in a four group, after each assessment I give uh, for a chapter or a module, I'll re-rank all the kids in the class on their strengths and their weaknesses. And then I'll actually put them into like specific groups. For example, if there's nine groups, the top nine kids would be like the nine captains and how they select people in their group is just based upon who's available when it's left. So when they get into their groups, they'll have the strengths um, separated out and how they're able to communicate, it doesn't really intimidate any of the kids. So each kid in every group feels that their group is strong, they feel balanced, and I feel like even in this scenario, even the weakest kid in the group has an opportunity to speak and the way we set it up is everybody has an opportunity to speak and their roles are very important. We've had a lot of success at this school with that setup, and uh, so I continued to use that today and I think the result was great. Uh, when I'm setting up my lesson, I look at the standards for mathematical practices. One of the ones that I think that encompasses all of them are standards for mathematical practice number one, which is um, make sense of every problem and persevere through solving them and standards for mathematical practice number six, which is attend to precision. Which again, I try to have that kids focus not on just their calculations, but how they communicate what they did and what they saw in the problem. So today during the warmups, our focus is just getting kids to start. I would say even five years ago, prior to starting the PLC training uh, through Math Generation, it was a standard, I take five problems from the night before, I put them up on the board and the kids are super, super quiet, and then I ask somebody for the answer and I say, you are correct, and then I just move on. So I believe in the last two years since shifting towards some of the standards for mathematical practice and then being part of the PLC training that's offered through Math Generation, I've really enhanced the start of my lesson. 
And so we pose either a question or a specific math problem. So I walk around the room and I'm really looking to see how many different ways the kids started the problem. And even halfway through, I might call out and say, interesting enough, there were three different ways people started this problem. And I might even be humble and say, I only thought of two. And then I give them a chance to work through the problem a little bit more. They might even have an opportunity to work with their A and B partner or even their group partner prior to them debriefing the problem together and then maybe coming up and presenting it. When you start on your warm up today, what I'd like you guys to do is I would like you guys to just take about three minutes, all right, to look over, try to make sense of the problem before you start coming up with some ideas of what you want to do. We're going to go three minute individual, then we're going to go to a three minute AB, and then we're going to go to a four to five minute all group. And I'm going to walk around and select some of you to come up and debrief that particular problem and present it in front of the class. Standard stuff. And then we'll go move right into a performance task that I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. So are there any questions for me at this time so far? Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Why did you naturally draw that parabola down? How'd you know to draw that parabola as a down you? The ball would hit the ground, come back and down and hit the ground. Okay. If you're looking at the uh, formula in standard form, did anything else tell you? Not really. No, not really? Okay. What do you think the quantities are here? It's the y-axis, so like the height. So it would be the height. So you're talking about the height of the ball? Yeah. Okay. And so what would be your quantities on the x-axis? The time. Time. All right. You like it? Look up really quick. I know you're not done with the problem. That was not the intention. I just wanted you to kind of get a feel for the problem. So for the next three to four minutes, I want you to share with your A and B partner how you started the problem, because everybody actually started. And I want you to share what, how you started the problem and what your thinking was and how you started the problem, okay? So right now, within your A, B partners, go ahead and kind of share what you guys did. The highest thing. And so then you plug in for negative zero to right to get two, and that would be your x axis prime for time. All right, look up one more time, you guys. I want to find out a couple things. Please raise your hand if you and your partner had a different starting point of how you thought about the problem, because I saw a couple on there, okay? All right. Anton, how is your guys' different? Um, I started it by trying to plug numbers into the equation. He was graphing the points. Okay. So when you say you were plugging numbers in the equation, well, let me ask you guys. When Anton said he was plugging numbers in the equation, what do you think he was looking for? What do you think he was looking for? How many of you guys started substituting numbers in? I saw a bunch, right? About a third of you. So what were you thinking? What were you looking for? So you were looking for the roots. Hmm. So where it might, what would the root tell you? Chan? Where it intersects the x-axis. Ah, oh, where it intersects the x-axis. Now, in this particular problem, what does that mean? Right now, actually take 30 seconds to discuss with your A and B partner what you think the intersection of the x-axis in this problem means. All right, go. So when it hits the x-axis, that's how we know when it hits the ground. <coughs> and we can find out the so time when it hits. Yes, yeah. yeah. yeah, so because, mm -hmm. well, we know it can't be negative because one. So you go, so there's there's one goes plus one, one answer, answer point, which is fine. So there's there's only one root. So the roots basically so mean that when the ball hits the ground after starting its initial point. And there's only one root because it starts on the y-axis. Let's transition back up. So I gave you a few seconds to discuss what you thought that intersection of the x-axis mean. I keep hearing people say that as I walk by. So somebody needs to debrief and tell me what you think that means. Seth? Uh, the point at which the height in this problem uh, is at zero. At zero. Okay, so what is this problem again? We need to kind of go back to what the original problem was. It was a ball. It was a ball being thrown up in the air. So you're saying as it hits the ground then, that's going to be one of the roots. Okay. All right. And what do you think the other root is then? Think about what the other root might be. How many of you factored it? How many of you factored it? Okay. What happened when you factored it? What were your two roots? Five, Five and negative one. one. Five and negative one. Hmm. Do you think any of those are extraneous? They don't work. Yeah. Which one? Negative one? Why? Why does negative one not work? You can't have negative time. 
times. You can't have negative time. So you're saying that it's possible for you to solve a problem algebraically and have two answers, but one of them just not make sense, all right? Here's a big question that we have never discussed before. In your four groups, I want you to talk about why you think it is going to be a negative root, why it became a negative root other than factoring in the actual problem of a ball being thrown up in the air from, what was that, 25 meters starting height? And as they threw it up in the air and it came down at whatever, what was this time again? What was the time that hit the ground? Five seconds. Five seconds. Why did they get a negative one? Why do you get a negative one uh, when you factored? Why did that happen, right? Spend about 60 seconds talking about that. It should be like we can tell that if it started here, that would be the original root, but yeah. since it didn't. It started, it started there. up there, yeah. yeah. And then it would hit over here. And you can't have negative time either. No. So it technically is only one root. Yeah. No, there. But there's two roots. Yeah, so just one doesn't work. Yeah. 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 Uh, one of the things that I think that the kids have enjoyed more than I anticipated was the amount they like to share. And when they're feeling confident about how they communicate what they know, they, they're really doing a good job coming up. A great example would be at the end of the year, kids kind of write letters to teachers. And one student said, I really want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to be in front of a classroom. I am very shy, as you know, and I feel this has helped me come out of my shell. And it's in something that I'm strong at, mathematics. And I was not strong at communicating, and I feel just in the 10 times I came up last term, it's made me more confident person. So I, I heard some really good things. So I need you to share. Um, there were two really good explanations that I heard. Uh, I know there were more, but I need somebody to kind of share out how they kind of knew where uh, one of them was going to be negative, right? One of the roots was going to be negative and, and why it doesn't really make sense in the problem. And about five other people had the exact same thing. So because I knew that it started at um, 0 0.25, it didn't start on the um, x axis where the root was 0. So I knew it had to go down here to the negative. Now, that axis of symmetry, where's that going to be? Where's the axis of symmetry going to be? Yes, man? It's going to be right at that maximum height, all right? And how did you, how did some of you, I see a two there. How did some of you get that two? Juwan? I'm negative b over 2a. Oh, so you use the rule. x equals negative b over 2a. And what else does that give us? That gives us the axis of symmetry, and what else? What else? The point on the x-axis where it will meet the maximum height. Ah, uh, right, so the x-coordinate of the vertex then. Okay. So here's what I'd like to do. I only want to spend a few more minutes in four groups, and then I actually want two groups to come up and present two different ways of doing it. I'm assuming the one that I saw half of you do was factoring, and the other half of you went and substituted some numbers in, and you actually created the parabola, just like you see here. So we're going to see some of the same things, but I want to see how you debrief it. I'll say it again. So you had this equation right here, and I plugged in different uh, x values to get the y value. And so first, when you started off at 25, you already knew that it was 0. And then when you threw it up, I plugged in that x is a 1, and the y value ended up being 40. And then when I plugged in 2, it ended up being 45. And so when I plugged in 3, it ended up becoming 40 again, so I saw that it was coming back down. So the maximum had to be 45, and that was a line of symmetry. And then when you plugged in 4 as the x value, you got 25 as your y value. And it showed that it was coming back down, and that's where it started as the same height. And when you plugged in a 5, you ended up getting 0. And when you saw that, it showed that uh, this 5 value as an x was a root, because that's where it intersected the x-axis. And how did you know that it was 2 seconds again? Negative b over 2a. All right, so you did it from standard form then? 
Where would you get that negative 20 from? Is that this upper velocity yeah, D sub zero? Yeah. Okay, all right, just wanted to make sure. So you're just in standard form right now? Uh-huh. Okay. And so the ball was two. Oh, okay, I see. But that, That's just the regular formula for a ball thrown. Yeah, but then you just plug in numbers. Yeah, so that's the clear, but that's the, that's how a clarifying okay. question works. Okay, okay. Like we understood how that related. I think that so I definitely would be a good one construct viable arguments because when we all got into groups, we had to. You had to. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely three. Definitely three. So number three. How about two? Yeah. I think two. Oh. Two also. Uh, two. Yeah, because you have to reason abstractly. And, and then. Four, yeah, I think I think that's good. Four is model of mathematics. Model of mathematics. mathematics. We didn't really model. Well, yeah. we used it. Well, uh, we applied we it did. in everyday life. And we used a graph. Yeah, because it is a word problem. So okay, word problem. So four I think, also. I think that's all that applies. And then what's on the back? Yeah, we're just so we're just well, missing there's, there's five. Six. We're missing five. We, we didn't use any tools. Yeah. We didn't use tools, no, no, so no, no seven or structure, eight. No. No. Okay. no. So I think, yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. all so that applies. So yeah. one, so six, three, two, four. So yeah. You. you guys, make sure you have it all structured. I'm going to have you guys do some of the presenting, so you guys kind of talk about that. Okay. Okay. I saw somebody graph the negative one and the five and then just draw the line of symmetry. You don't even have to, if you factor right, you don't, you, now that you know a lot about it, you don't even have to use negative b over two if you don't want to, because you know it's going to be in between, right? The line of symmetry, so that's good stuff, you guys. Really good stuff. Okay. Did anybody factor out a negative five first? Yeah, I did. Oh, you did? You factored out a negative five first, okay. Okay, good, good, I like that. Really good stuff, you guys. Because, you know, have that negative five. You know that it's going to be a down U. So without that, I mean, I think it kind of changes how you would theoretically graph the equation. When Some of you were kind of, you did a great job talking about extension questions. I just heard one about the ball bouncing, and we're going to get into that here in a little bit. This will be a long warm up for you because this some of the things I heard you guys say really amazing and I want to talk about that a little bit further. So let's get two minutes to wrap it up. We're going to get a couple groups up there to debrief and then I really want you to focus on beyond this problem or how do we extend the problem, okay? All right, two minutes. Maybe if you're playing golf, because golf is already slow. No, because this time there's like a starting pipe, though. Not just uh, true. You maybe if you're on like a hill on a golf course and you gotta shoot it into the. Yes. Okay. So. So we're gonna have a couple groups present, and remember, we want to critique the reasoning of others. How was theirs the same as yours? How was it different? Look at some of the similarities of what they did and what you did, and look at some of the differences. I heard some one group over here say, um, we could have did that from the beginning. And I heard a group over here say, wonder what would happen if you graphed the ball bouncing, what type of ball it would be. And we'll talk about that when we get to some extension questions, because I think those will be very valuable to you understanding and really putting meaning to the problem. All right. So for A, the question was, when will the ball hit the ground? And so what I started off doing was I saw the equation, or the yeah, the equation. And then I perceived uh, time to be x and the height to be y. And so I plugged in different x's to find uh, different y's. And I found out that y would be 0 when x is 5. So I got um, the, ground, the ball hit the ground at um, 5 seconds. And for b, we had to find the, uh, when it would reach the maximum height. And so I looked on my graph, and the point was highest at 2 seconds. And that happened to be when uh, it was 45 meters up. So it was 45 meters up. Okay. Let me ask you a quick question. Let me do you, right at that point, you guys. Did he use a formula? Did he factor? What did he do? That was a little bit different than the way some of you did it. I just saw something there on D. What is that? One, two, three, four, and six. What are those? Oh, so you felt like? Let's see. You definitely did SMP one, right? And what else do I always say you're doing for the last two years? Six, one and six, attended precision. And I think he was pretty precise on the way he described that. And you thought two was reasoned abstractly and quantitatively? I would say he had to do that, right? He didn't start plugging in negative numbers. Why did he not plug in negative numbers? Because time's not gonna be negative. All right, very good. And then for modeling, you think just by graphing the problem, he modeled it? I would say that also because it's a word problem and they're asking for a specific set of values that they want to know, all right? 
And again, like I said, my favorite is always six, making sure you're precise. All right, thank you very much. Good job, Daniel. Throughout a lesson, I think it's extremely important that we don't give generic compliments. So when I give compliments to students, it isn't great job kids, it's I like the way Billy set this problem up. He was very precise when he modeled the problem. So what I have found that and the kids appreciate more is it's specific to either them, their group, and even the class you can be specific about how they transitioned into something or how they enhance the problem and how they're thinking. So one of the goals for me as a teacher uh, the last two years is I've been really focusing on how I give praise and that it's meaningful and it's less generic than just saying great job kids. They've been hearing that forever. They leave the dentist's office and they get a sticker um, and I just never wanted to be like that. I want to know that they specifically did something great and so I try my best to do as many of those compliments but make it really meaningful and direct to what I saw whether it's how they communicated, how they set up a problem, how they communicated in their group, a leadership role they took, or just how they found a mistake I may have made in a problem. So the first question is asking the vertical height of the bowl of glass around the show. So, right. so let's draw the triangle first. Be precise, be clear, be concise. Be, be clear, and if you're going to be clear, be crystal clear. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so let's just solve for the bottom of the sphere and then we can divide by two after. Wait, where are you guys splitting it? Yeah, I can split by half. So, so right here, did you guys do a... We use the Pythagorean theorem. Oh, Pythagorean theorem, okay. Yeah. And so, oh, and that three then comes from... Half a six. Half okay. six, yeah, three. I like it. Now, how did you deal with that, uh, that hemisphere? It's a half circle, so it's we a, found, yeah. yes. So we found the this. volume we of the sphere, sphere half, and then so we this by half. Yeah. Not, not circle, sphere. Sphere, so and then, then you just kind of half. Divided it by two. Yep. Divided by two. Oh, so no, you just said four, six. six. That means you just manipulated the formula? Yeah, so, so we to have include, have Yes, so you, you actually made your own formula for a, a hemisphere. Yeah. Okay, four, six, or two thirds, right? Yeah. Whoa. All right. Yeah, think about that, right? Huh? That's why they pay me the big bucks, boys. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm saying is, the radius could be, this could be three, or this could be three. It's either way. But if, if, if you look at a circle, what's the best Yeah, yeah it goes all the way around. Yeah, it's just not. As long as it's from the center to the edge, it's a radius. The top, only the bottom half of it is a sphere, so the top half is a cylinder. So if we extended it more, it's like, no, but let's say you are making this the radius like three or I mean four from here, we know not. like from here to here, then this part wouldn't be a sphere because it's like yeah, so already part of the cylinder. So your volume is Got it? So like it would be a pill shape, I guess. Okay. So All right, everybody look up please. I um I love some of the um critiquing you guys were doing on number three and the challenge that it uh, has, and I'm, I'm looking forward to some people debriefing it and critiquing it. For number one, it said find the vertical height of the bowl of glass three and show your work. So the glass three is a cone up here, so it has a diameter of six or a radius of three and a, a slant height of six. So I cut that in half to get this right triangle, which is which has a small length of three and a hypotenuse of six. So we're trying to find the height there. So what you do is since the smaller leg is actually one half of the hypotenuse, you can use the converse of the 30, 60, 90 theorem, which is the longer leg is root three times the length of the shorter leg. So then it is three root three is equal to the height. And then I got the height is approximately 5.3. 
20 centimeters. So how do you think almost everybody else at this school would have done that particular problem, including you and me, right? Clovis? Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem. I, did anybody else see the 30, 60, 90? <laughs> Santiago, I take back everything I said about you, man. That is really good. 30, 60, 90, pretty impressive. Do you see it now, where the hypotenuse is twice the length of one of the legs? So then with the, the ratios, it's going to be 3 root 3. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm kind of, in, I'm not that embarrassed. I mean, he's a smart kid. I, I didn't see that. So very nicely done. As we're shifting towards some common core math standards and the mathematical practices, the other thing that has become more aware to me is how to differentiate my instruction. Prior to two years ago, to me, I didn't really know what it meant. I've been to workshops, I've been to speakers, and I still never got a clear view of what it is. And now I feel much more comfortable about, in the classroom, how I can differentiate instruction. And to me, it comes from the questions that you ask kids. We can ask different types of questions to the same problem and have some of the same goals in mind. So I might ask student A a specific question about a quadratic equation. How do you know that it opens upward as a graph? But I might ask student four, why would this have two roots? And what does it mean to have the roots? So I believe now with these mathematical practices, student, math, student standards for mathematical practices, and the standards getting more in depth, I have a better grasp of differentiating within the class, within the same problem, and the same problem sets that I hand out. I feel as a, a teacher, at first it was such a scary idea to have this huge shift uh, towards the standards for mathematical practices and the uh, the new Common Core content standards, but I feel like a brand new teacher. I'm excited about uh, the possibility of getting kids to think deeper and to understand math more than that one day you taught a skill. So I definitely am excited about this opportunity and I take the, the fear and put it into the excitement and into the planning and work with my colleagues to, to come up with better problems and better questioning strategies, and uh, we're just excited about our work and we're excited about the years to come. Thank you.